Hello, and welcome to another installment of the Coford Lecture Series. This is an ongoing series of discussions on a variety of topics. If you've missed any of our past uh, discussions, then you can find them two ways. You can find them in audio through our podcast, which is the Greg Coford Books author cast, or you can also find them on video on our YouTube channel. Just uh, look up Greg Coford Books, and uh, while you're there, so hit the subscribe button so you'll be notified of any of our future content. We want to welcome everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, appreciate seeing you. I see that we've got, uh, looks like, at least 10 people right now watching us. So hopefully we'll get a few more. If you'd like to help us to try to get a few more, uh, please feel free to share this post and uh, see if we can grab a few more viewers. Uh, but uh, otherwise, if, you'd, if you don't want to share it, we understand. Uh, but if you can at least hit like uh, or love, hopefully not the sad face or angry face, then that will also help us to get some visibility. Uh, we do appreciate that you're here and we hope that during the course of this discussion that you guys will chime in and uh, give us any of your comments or questions that you would like to ask. We do welcome your participation. Corey Bell, good to see you from Orem, Utah. Just a quick announcement before we begin, we are currently running a back to church sale on a select number of titles through our website. Titles include popular books like Bridges, Ministering to Those Who Question, uh, Women at Church, and uh, Whom Say You That I Am, The Lessons from Jesus of Nazareth, and many other titles. So visit Greg Coford Books to check out that sale. So now on to tonight's topic. We will be discussing Oliver Olney, a lesser known figure in Mormon history, uh, but a significant figure for the Nauvoo era. Oliver is what one might call a dissident, although I'm not uh, overly fond of that term, uh, but uh, he was a what we fondly call a dissident prophet. Uh, we'll get into the reasons for Oliver's disaffection from church leadership, but what makes his writings particularly valuable is that he remained in Nauvoo after his excommunication, and he recorded the things that he saw. Uh, so his short but dense record that he left behind serves as an outsider confirmation uh, to some of the key events that took place in Nauvoo, and we're going to discuss those tonight. Additionally, Oliver also claimed to have his own series of revelations and spiritual visions and visitations uh, that makes his record even more entertaining. I'll just leave that as a teaser. Our guest tonight is Richard Moore. Richard is the editor of the writings of Oliver H. Olney, April 1842 to, 18, to February 1843, Nauvoo, Illinois. I've put a link to his book in the comments, so feel free to check that out. Richard received his bachelor's and master's degree from BYU in American history and his doctorate in education from the University of the Pacific. He retired after teaching 38 years for the church educational system as a seminary teacher, institute instructor and director, and as an instructor for the ancient scripture department at BYU. Dr. Moore is a Richard L. Evans fellow serving as a member of BYU's Office of Religious Outreach. The author of four published books and more than a dozen articles, Richard presents often at BYU's Education Week and the John Whitmer Historical Association Conference. Richard and his wife, Lanny, live in Orem, Utah, and they have three children and nine grandchildren. Welcome, Richard. It's good to see you. Good to see you. So why don't we go ahead and, and dig right in, and again, we'll uh, periodically stop to see if there's any comments or questions as we go along. So I guess the first question that I have is, uh, given your pedigree, Richard, what made you decide to publish an anti-Mormon book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that would be very surprising to my family and uh, anyone who knows me well. Yeah, I think that's uh, that would be the case. <laughs> um, but seriously, though, since uh, since Oliver isn't a very well-known figure, uh, what can you tell us about him and, and your interest in him? Well, I kind of stumbled across him, actually. Um, in, in 2011, uh, the John Whitmer Historical Association Conference was being held in Nauvoo, and the theme was from the one many or out of the one many. And so I was trying to come up with a, a topic to, to uh, present a paper on. 
and uh, we're looking through a bunch of things. And I remembered reading in, in teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith about uh, a number of uh, people who were at that time kind of kind of starting their own thing or trying to start their own thing who had been involved with the restoration. So I, um, I, I dug around a little bit to found the original article was in the Times and Seasons in the in April 1842. And it, it talked about people throughout history who have uh, kind of taken a different road. Uh, and, and then it came to that current time and he, and they mentioned the editor and it was attributed to Joseph Smith, who was the editor at the time, but I'm not really sure whether he wrote it. Uh, he may have, I just don't know, but he, he mentioned three or four names of people at that time or since the Kirtland time who had kind of uh, been involved with the restoration, taken a different path and Oliver only was one of them. So I, I wondered if I could get enough information about only to, to get a paper out of it. And uh, as I did a, did a little digging, I found out that uh, at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale, he had his personal writings, handwritten writings uh, over 450, 470 pages. And so I, I got a hold of those and started going through them and uh, came up with a paper and uh, made the presentation at the, at the conference, at the John Whitmer conference, and then was invited by Greg Coford to uh, to get the whole thing done and and turn it in and, and turn it into a book. And that's that's kind of where I became interested in Olney's writings. Yeah, and when you say that you were invited by Greg Coford, you don't mean the company, you mean Greg Coford himself. No, him, himself. He was there at the presentation. And when I when I finished the presentation, he came up to me and said, we would like to do that book. And I said, okay. And so I started the the efforts of trying to read Olney's writings uh, his his handwriting is horrific, uh, and then of course there's no, there was no standardized spelling at the time, so it was hard to read. It used to take me an hour and a half to get through a page, uh, but after going through six, seven, eight times, you know, I got so I could read it pretty well. So tell us about Oliver Olney. Who was he? Hardly anybody has heard of him. <clears throat> yeah, it, he is. He's pretty well unknown. Uh, even people very familiar with church history, LDS church history, are not familiar with Olney for the most part. Uh, I'm always surprised when people are. You know, it, it surprises me. He joined the church uh, in about. We don't know have the exact date of his baptism, but uh, 1831. He was living in Ohio at the time. After joining the church, moves to Kirtland. He and his wife. Uh, and he's there in Kirtland during the kind of the Kirtland growth period. He uh, he's married to uh, Alice uh, Johnson, who was the daughter of John Johnson. So she would be the sister of Luke and Lyman Johnson. And so they're in Nauvoo or they're in uh, Kirtland for a time. Uh, he becomes the president of the teachers quorum while he's in Kirtland. Uh, they move to Missouri. Uh, after the Missouri persecutions, they moved to Illinois. He he lives in Nauvoo, uh, goes on a mission back to the east uh, eastern states. While he's gone, his wife Alice uh, dies. Uh, so when he gets back, uh, he discovers that she has passed away. Um, while he after after that point, he just becomes kind of disgruntled with uh, the church and the leadership, and then decides to uh, well he's he's called in. Uh, kind of for a disciplinary council, and uh, and loses his membership, and starts writing uh, what he sees that that uh, bothers him, and 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 he's doing this with the plans he says he thinks he's going to publish, and eventually he does publish a couple of booklets. Well, why don't we dig into some of the issues that he seemed okay. to have with uh, with with the church leadership, and that that it led to his. Just being, was it excommunicated or disfellowshipped, or was that the? He was ex he was yeah. excommunicated. Okay. Uh, he he expresses it differently than than they did at the at, at the disciplinary council. They he said they asked for his writings uh, because he'd been receiving revelations and writing them up and evidently sharing them with people. And so they called him in and asked him for his writings, and he refused to give them. And so it becomes a little confusing there, because in one of his booklets, he said, they took my writings from me. But in his other personal writings, he said, they tried to, and I refused to give it to them. So I don't know whether they got them or not. But he became uh, disaffected because of a number of things. One is he saw 
he saw church leaders as kind of an elite thing. It's elitism where uh, there were only a few in charge and the rest of them were, you know, the, the rank and file. And that bothered him. Um, I think a lot of this, I, and I didn't put this in the book, but I've been thinking about it a lot recently. He, I think he has more problems because uh, of, he was uh, born and raised in the United States. I think some of the people coming from Great Britain and other places uh, where, you know, they had a, a king or a queen or whatever, weren't as bothered by leadership that was, you know, uh, just a few people, uh, you know, like the prophet, thus saith the Lord, here's what we're going to do. But uh, I, he's very much into the democracy. In fact, he's a huge fan of Andrew Jackson and wrote a tribute to Andrew Jackson, which is in the book he'd planned to publish as well. So I think he's bothered by by that elitism, by the, by the leadership uh, that seems to be a uh, pretty narrow leadership of certain, just a f certain few. I think, uh, you know, you've got the quorum of the anointed that seems to be elite. Um, you've got even the Relief Society, which in his mind was the elite women of the church and others didn't, uh, were not involved. I think he kind of felt like it was the, the dregs of Mormon society were asked to do all the work and contribute to everything while the, the leaders kind of just enjoyed their labors. So that's, yeah. that's one thing. His financial situation was another thing. He, I don't know if he ever had much money, but when he got back from the mission, he he had no money, and uh, and so that he saw he experienced poverty. He saw poverty around him, but he he felt like the church leaders were living comfortably, and he assumed that they were living off uh, tithing and the law of consecration, uh, and so that bothered him that. The presumed uh, uh, perceived greed of church leaders with tithing, the law of consecration. Uh, uh, he he felt like they were prospering. The leaders were. Uh, he he figured they were skimming the funds, um, and he he believed also that uh, when he saw them trying to build the Nauvoo House in the temple, and he saw a lot of funds come in, and then he didn't see much progress. He wondered where the funds were going. So Got that it. was another Got thing. Another thing was um, his being, he felt like he was mistreated by church leaders. There was the church court uh, losing his membership, the demand over his writings, um, and then the idea that were his writings taken or stolen from him or not, I don't know. And then the fact that he felt like he was uh, not being seen as valid, a valid person for his own personal revelations that... Uh, he was not given a role of importance after his uh, serving as the president of the teachers corps in Kirtland. He never really served in any other leadership position. And so there may have been some jealousy there. Um, he also believed that Joseph was a fallen prophet. Uh, I don't know if he thought so at the time. I don't think so. I think at Kirtland, I think looking back, he looked at the Kirtland Safety Society. He sees the Mormons run out of Missouri and that bothered him. He sees happenings in Nauvoo, hears a lot of rumors, the assassination attempt of ex-Governor Boggs, uh, that it was attributed to, uh, to at least to, to Joseph and Porter Rockwell, and uh, rumors about Danite still going on. And, and then just the fact that he just, he just felt like he had been called to do the Lord's work, and they weren't giving him any credit. And then, of course, polygamy. Uh, the rumors rolling around Nauvoo at the time... That troubled him greatly, according to his writings. Yeah, that gives us a lot to chew on for tonight, and we're going to try to hit some of these issues. But I, one quick question that came to my mind was, was he in Missouri, or did he kind of go from Ohio straight over to Nauvoo? He was, he was in Missouri. Okay. Do you know whereabouts he was in Missouri? Was uh, he in... Uh... I, I do not know for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, very interesting. So he was witness. I mean, it sounds like to me that it, particularly you said he married into the Luke and Lyman Johnson family, uh, their sister, right? Or was it? Right. Right. Yeah. Their right. Their sister. sister. And, and of course they were very prominent in, uh, in, in the earliest days of the church. In fact, I, I right. believe that uh, some of the significant revelations were on the Johnson farm, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the John Johnson farm and uh, the section 76 is the best known one. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he had all the makings of somebody who, who could have been on, in the inner circle, right. As far as his origins 
uh, right. in the church. The, the connections were there. Yeah, initially, anyway, right? Mm-hmm. But it seems like right. after he serves his mission and becomes a widower, it seems at that point that there's there's this departure. Uh, or does it feel? I mean, does it feel kind of like he was somewhat pushed to the side a little bit, or did it kind of go both I, ways? I or think he, I think he felt he was. I, I don't know yeah. if he was or not, but he he certainly felt he was because he wasn't involved with uh, the the inner circle, like you said. I also think, and this is personal opinion, but from from everything I read and studied about him, it seems like his wife was the real strength in him. I, I'm not saying he wasn't a good, strong, solid, uh, you know, Latter-day Saint at one time, but I'm when his wife passed away, I, I think she was his foundation in a lot of ways. And, and uh, after, after she was gone and I'm, I, I don't know much about her except when she, when she passed away, um, Eliza R. Snow wrote a, a really wonderful tribute to her that was published in the Times and Seasons. So I have the impression like that Alice Olney was was quite an incredible person, a really, a really solid, a wonderful person. Yeah. That may have kept him grounded. Yeah, yeah. So the other things that you brought up was that um, you think after reflecting on this, that there may have been some disgruntlement that he sees about elitism, particularly during the Jacksonian period, right? And and you said that he did some writing on uh, on Andrew Jackson. He did. He wrote he wrote a big tribute. They in, in the local newspaper they were talking about Andrew Jackson, and and so he wrote this big long tribute and and I don't know if it was ever published but he it's it's in the book it's uh he was a big fan of Andrew Jackson yeah so I'm I'm as you know I'm going to draw some inferences from that that I think make some sense um like you uh so I think that you know one of the things that people who are really drawn to Andrew Jackson uh were kind of drawn to this this ideal of the common man right yeah. and this democratization of of religion uh, in particular at the time. And I know that for those who sat outside of Nauvoo, uh, but were in the County, that was a very Jacksonian era, uh, or peer area, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, the areas that were helpful to the Latter-day Saints after Missouri, uh, were still very Jacksonian, uh, Southern Illinois was very Jacksonian. And, uh, one of the things that really seemed to, get their grit was this idea of a, uh, a monarch, a monarchy that they were seeing arise in Nauvoo, right. right? This, this theocratic form of government was really, in, in my opinion, that was a far bigger concern than uh, particularly a militant, right? An armed right. theocratic the government. Movement. Right. Right. And, and, and only uh, talks about that. He talks about the Legion and he talks about the the his belief that the that the Mormons under the direction of Joseph Smith that he would become the king, and that they would actually try to take over the United States. He felt like, and he even gave his opinion that they would go west, and unite with the Native Americans, and then come back and start taking over the entire United States. He felt that was their plan. Yeah, interesting. And the mission to the Lamanites has it never really went away. I mean, it, you know, even through, through all this, this period of having this, this uh, sort of civil war in Missouri and having to find a new place uh, to center themselves. But I mean, the mission, the idea of converting indigenous people to the message still, still was remained. Right. And it was still something that was discussed. Absolutely. Uh, And, and I know that he, I find it interesting because I know that Oliver, was an outsider. He wasn't invited to things like the council of 50, for example. Uh, I'm not even sure if he knew that the council of 50 existed. I don't know. He he never mentions it. He never mentions it. So there's a good indication considering everything else he does mention is a good indication. He'd never, it never heard of it. Yeah. Um, But even the council of 50, they were discussing still, you know, restarting the mission to the Lamanites. And things like that. I guess Very one, interesting. One thing, that, one thing that surprised me, honestly, was, uh, and, and uh, we've talked about this before uh, previously, I had always believed that they did not plan to go to the Rocky Mountains until after the death of Joseph Smith. 
only says they're talking about it in 1842. They're making plans in 1842 to go to the Rocky Mountains, planning on sending uh, groups there and then groups a little bit at a time and sending them there. Uh, so that was a little surprising to me. I, I'd, I'd heard that some people had believed that, but I this this kind of uh, substantiates that belief that only yeah. they're talk, they're going to go. They're planning on going. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting because it seems like there were a few, uh, a, a few sort of um, let's try this out kind of kind of things. Like so, for example, uh, you know Sidney Rigdon, he's setting up a stake over in uh, the Pennsylvania uh, area, right? And then we've got Lyman White, who you know, I mean, he's up in Wisconsin um, at the lumber mills, but he's he's told that he's gonna go down to Texas ultimately, right? And and look at a possible relocation site uh, in and Texas. Does, and, and does go And down. does, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and he ends up staying down there, yeah, right. And, right. Uh, but but it's interesting that, you know, and I think that I, I've, I've read before of this, this concept that Nauvoo was gonna become sort of the hub of the, ax, like the axis of the wheel, right? And that there would be these multiple stakes sort of branching out from the axis of the wheel. Um, but you're talking about that he was aware that there might be complete relocation. The way the way he talks about it, they would send uh, some groups forward first and then send more. And then eventually the impression I got from what I read is that eventually they would send everybody would go out there and and uh, yeah. and again, unite with the Native Americans and build up this army. He even talks about having, you know so many thousands of in the, in the army, you know, and they'll, they'll be a hundred thousand strong and they'll come back and, and march into back to the States and kind mm. of take over. That's, that's fascinating too, considering Joseph Smith's letter to Congress uh, offering to take a hundred thousand lead an army of a hundred thousand into the air Oregon territory to, uh, to establish it for the United States. Right. Which at that time was British ruled. So I wonder if he heard some rumors of, Maybe so. I don't know where you get hundred thousand people to go at that time, though. You know, right, right. I mean, that's so. uh, that's that's a pretty large call. Um, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about some of the things that that he witnessed in Nauvoo uh, that he wrote about, and you know, this would be post eighteen forty two, right? Which is uh, at this point, his relationship is severed, right? Right. Um, so let's talk about some of those things. Like, so for example. Uh, what did he have to say about um, Freemasonry entering into Nauvoo? Uh, he mentions that quite a bit, and he he, see, he sees them establish a, 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 a Mason. What am I thinking? The word uh, a lodge. Uh, thank you, a Masonic lodge. There, uh, the Masonic lodge was established. He says he doesn't know much about Masonry, but he's bothered with the the Mormons setting up this uh, Masonic lodge. And he calls it a number of times newfangled masonry. And again, he sees that as kind of an elite thing, that certain yeah. men were allowed to belong to it. And then, and, and he even sees the establishment of the Relief Society as a female version of masonry. That's that's what he views it as. The, what does he say about that? Masons. Well, he just he talk he calls it the female Masons, and and he's mm. I don't know why he's be why he'd be bothered by that if he's not a Mason and doesn't know anything about Masonry, he he says in his writings I, I I don't know anything about them I don't know that they're you know good or bad or anything, but he's greatly bothered by the Mormon Masons, and the female Relief Society Masons is the way he sees it. He's really bothered by that. Not sure why. Uh, just as irritated that yeah. they're doing this and and it may be again because he was not invited uh i don't know yeah i don't know well i i think i think you can put a little bit of this into historical context of masonry's reputation at the time um yeah. in in the jacksonian age i mean this was there there was a lot of people who were very skeptical of of masonry primarily because they saw it as an elitist society Right. And and because they thought that it had too much power in politics. Um, so, I, I, you know, and that they were secretive. Right. Those are and, and any sort of secretive society, you know, another again, that's another issue that people had with with the government that they saw rising in Nauvoo was that it was secretive. And now they've got now they are really the largest group of Masons in the entire state of Illinois. 
Uh, in fact, actually, really, the entire nation they were they had the largest concentration of masons. I did in, not uh, know that. Yeah, in Nauvoo. Yeah, because so many people began joining the lodge. So many men, I should say. And then well, that doesn't course, sound that elitist, then, does it? If yeah, that yeah. Many joining. Of course, if he's not a member at that time, he's been excommunicated. Therefore, he maybe would not be invited. Therefore, again, he still might consider it elitist. Yeah. 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 I still, you still had to be invited, right? It wasn't a, yeah. you didn't just show up and knock. Um, yeah. You had to have somebody vouch for you. And if nobody was vouching for him as an excommunicant, you know, yeah. but, so it, but it's interesting to me that he stayed in Nauvoo. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. Know, he mentions others leaving. He mentions others feeling like they were forced out or feeling like I don't feel comfortable here anymore. I'm going to move. I don't, it's not what I expected when I moved here. I'm going to leave, but he stays. He's interesting. And part of it is to, I think, get more dirt on, on church leaders, perhaps. But you know what? It's funny that uh, he, he says that he says a number of times, I don't know, my life might be in danger, but he, he doesn't, I don't think he ever really believes that. Uh, he, I think he might write that for the sensationalistic ef effect, but yeah. he's, he stays in Nauvoo and doesn't seem to be nervous about anything. And he goes to meetings. He'll continue to go to church meetings and other meetings that they have. He continues to go to these things. So I don't know. That is fascinating, fascinating. that he would especially continue to attend. And um, But he, um, you, you mentioned his financial situation was, was pretty, uh, I don't know, slim. Um, so I wonder if that had anything to do with his potential of relocation. I don't know. Maybe, but, you know, if you don't have any money in Nauvoo, I don't know if you wouldn't have any money anywhere else. I, I don't know. And uh, I don't know if he hadn't, you know, work there. I don't know. I, I know that he was trying to figure out ways to raise uh, silkworms and do things like that. And uh, um, he was also arrested in 1843 for burglary uh, in Nauvoo. Uh, and that's a weird one too, because he and another guy, I, I think it was Newell Nurse. Uh, I'm, I may, I may be wrong on that. I've forgotten. I haven't got my book in the mail yet, by the way. So no, I nor, nor have I. No, <laughs> nor have I, Richard. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I wish I could have read it before I did this interview. Uh, so he got. He was arrested in 1843, and and then there's a thing in the newspaper that says he escaped. And and that's the last I ever hear of it. He's back in Nauvoo. There's no. There, there's no mention of his capture or any jail time or anything. Maybe it was just resolved. Maybe it was just resolved out, outside of, you know, uh, him having to do any time. I don't know. But he also um, had to farm out his kids. He had some kids. Mm -hmm. And again, with no money, he, he basically rented a room in a, like in an attic uh, uh, from a man. And then he... Um, kind of put his kids in different places and, and, but he would write and say, I'm getting ready to have some of the girls come back and, and set up a home and, and uh, have the family back together again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go over to the comments here real quick and see okay. what we've uh, see if we've have some, some things to address. Uh, I'm just going to say hello again to everybody who's joining us. looks like we've got about 15 people watching right now. Um, let's see. Cheryl Bruno is with us from Riverdale, California. Ryan Hepworth is with us and says, Rich has no bigger fan. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Carissa <know> Cooper. Ryan. <laughs> Carissa Cooper is with us and saying hello, watching from Denver, Colorado. And we've got Doug Gibson from Ogden, Utah, just down the street from me. Russ Osmond is with us. Hello, Russ. Oh, from hi, Russ. Atlanta. I know. Good Russ. see you. And uh, let's see, now we got a couple of questions here. Well, Jay Red is uh, watching from Santa Clara. Good to see you, Jay. Um, now we got a couple of questions here, and I think, uh, no, you haven't addressed this yet. Douglas Stringer asked, did Olney remarry? Yes. Yes, he did. Uh, in 1843, October of 1843, he married a woman by the name of Phoebe Wheeler. Uh, and I've got one letter, I think one, maybe two letters in there uh, from her to her uh, family uh, talking about only and how great she thinks he is. And, and it's interesting because, you know, he was troubled by the Relief Society. Phoebe Wheeler was the first or she was the assistant secretary yeah. in the first Relief Society. Uh, and again, they, they lived in Nauvoo for a time and even yeah. come back to Nauvoo. 
So, um, yeah, I, I don't know that, but yeah, he remarried uh, Phoebe Wheeler, and and I don't know after that, I don't know whatever happened to him because uh, we kind of lose track of Olney. Um, there, I, I, I found evidence that he probably passed away in 1846 or 47, maybe 48, and still in Illinois, but that, no, no concrete evidence. No. That is, it is interesting. He seems to continually remarry into pretty close to the inner circles of, yeah. you know, of, of church leadership. But he's, um, I mean, obviously by this point, by the time that he remarried, there's his relationship has been severed for quite a while. So, right. And, but it's yeah, interesting that she would accept him as a, as a husband. That's right. Cause she's yeah. totally involved, totally active and very much a believer in her letters. She talks about, uh, her, her great faith in the prophet Joseph and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So. It is interesting that she would kind of, they would hook up like that. It makes me wish that we had some sort of photograph of him because he must have been dashing <laughs> to keep it. <laughs> you know, we do have it not, not from him, but a description from somebody else that he was a big, strong man. Oh, okay. So maybe, oh, okay. maybe that's why nobody hassled him in Nauvoo, you know, he's a big, strong man, you know, who knows? <laughs> All right. So Cheryl Bruno asks, does Olney write anything about Danites in Nauvoo? He he does, but he the only thing he says is he sees the Masonic Lodge as the new Danites. That's he doesn't talk about any Danite action or anything taking place, but when he sees the lodge develop, he says he says, I think they I think they are the Danites. I think they're they're just a new name for the same thing, the Danites. Fascinating. Okay, and then uh, Ryan Hepworth jokingly says he hasn't read his own book yet. <laughs> um, of course, he read it when he was proofing it and you know indexing it and spent quite a bit of time uh, in it. But um, but uh, but Ryan, you do bring up a good point that I should I should mention. Um, I don't know if, if everybody who is watching this is aware of what's going on right now in the printing world, uh, but um, there has actually been, which is, it's good news, but it's bad news. Uh, there has been a, an, a surge of people buying books. Um, and that's, and it goes along with this, this sheltering in place and, you know, staying home more often people are buying books um, and, and it's good. I'm so happy to see that people are buying books, but what it's doing is it's backlogging the printers uh, who can't get the books printed fast enough and who are um, behind on orders who can't get the paper supply. That's a huge issue right now because most uh, book printers get their paper from China. Um, so huge issues right now with in the printing world. So um those who are ordering from us uh, just know that most of our books get direct shipped from the printer. And uh, so when the printer is backlogged, it causes delays. Um, so be patient and be charitable uh, or buy a Kindle version <laughs> if you want it sooner. <laughs> my, my question my question is now, my, my son's friend said, oh, I got mine. Oh, yeah. And then I heard yeah, somebody sure. else had theirs. Yeah. Cheryl just commented that she has her book already. So, so what happened is why don't you, Brian? Why don't you and I have ours yet? Because <laughs> because we're we we're bottom one. we're bottom of the totem pole. We didn't we didn't do pre orders. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Is those who did pre orders they were the first up for uh, for printing. I did get an email saying that uh, mine had been shipped. There you, so go. there you go. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see it. Excited. <laughs> see how it turns out. All right. So back to the questions at hand. Uh, Doug Gibson says, could you talk about Oliver's contradictory writings on polygamy? Yeah. Uh, he, he clearly comes out, uh, you know, where he says he's bothered by that. Uh, he, he's bothered by the rumors he's heard. I don't know if he knows much. I don't think he knows much detail, but he's heard a lot of rumors. And so that troubles him. And yet, at the same time, there, there's this, there's a couple of entries there, but I'm not sure what to even think about it. Uh, because he, he says, been commanded by the, the Lord to make a list of 30 women and then later 30 more. So 60 women. He also said that Elizar Snow had been given to him. 
Um, so I, I don't know. Well, I don't know who the women are. I mean, I know I know some of who they are, but I don't know why he's commanded to to uh, choose thirty and then thirty more. Uh, I know that maybe he's thinking that for some of them in in leadership roles. You know, in in what he would hope to do, he hopes to kind of redo the church, kind of a uh, 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 just kind of a correct some things and get it back on track. Um, but but he never says anything about women leadership. Uh, some of the women he chooses uh, are have already passed away, so I don't hmm. know. He, is he thinking of a? Is he is he thinking of a, a future thing when he has a bunch of wives together? D is he thinking of them as wives? That's the thing. I just I just don't know what he's thinking. Uh, Phoebe Wheeler's on the list, but there's another woman on the list that that he's writing back and forth to that they they discuss marriage and then it just kind of we kind of lose track of her and it, it, she breaks off with him. So again, that that's a little contradictory. And and again, is he truly bothered by? plural marriage or is he bothered that he wasn't invited to be involved and, and and he does say this here he is single now he's a widower and he's looking to remarry and he says some of these single girls are seem to be taken by guys who are already married that's his view and he, that bothers him that they're they're kind of cutting down the dating pool i guess uh by by uh, you know having men who are already married pick up another wife. Yeah. Now, does he make any other critiques about what he sees with plural marriage in or or spiritual wifery is is a term that he uses? Yeah. Uh, he he does figure that if they if these church leaders marry uh, a bunch of women and have a bunch of more kids, that they'll certainly need. He says they've got to have bigger houses and and. Where that where's that going to come from? Unless it's from the tithing of the people, that's that's kind of bothers him too. Interesting. Okay, so he's talking about it really from an economic standpoint. So both both that it's it's decreasing his dating pool potential right. as a widower, but also right. because he's saying, well, they're going to have to care for and provide for these these extra wives. It's going to require. Mm -hmm built, you know, growing bigger houses. Where's that money going to come from? Well, it's going to come from us. It's going to come from our pockets. That's, right. That's what he's saying. Yeah. So, so it's a critique of elitism again, right? It is. He mentions John C. Bennett quite often. Now it's interesting that he's called into his church court by John C. Bennett. Hmm. You know, John C. Bennett's still uh, in leadership position at that time. And so, uh, so John C. Bennett calls him in for this, uh, for this church court and that's, he'll lose his membership. Uh, and then he he reads John C. Bennett's writings and he hears the rumors about John C. Bennett. He's irritated that Bennett ever found a, a role in leadership when he was that kind of guy. You know, he he's saying, how did he ever get into that position if he was that bad? Because they didn't think he was that bad when they put him in those positions. Uh, and then he also s states that he said, Bennett, uh, he says, I write because I feel it my duty and obligation to God. Bennett writes just because he's angry. And that's referring to Bennett's later writings. Yeah. So about 1843, I think around there. Right. Um, that's interesting. So, I mean, and I think that's important to re recognize often when we discuss church history, we tend to focus on John C. Bennett as being really some, one of the first detractors in Nauvoo. Right. Uh, and, and only predates, Bennett, as far as being a detractor and being yeah, open that, about that, it. Yeah, it's pretty close. Uh, but he he doesn't really throw Bennett under the bus. He he says, I he says, I don't know him. I don't know, you know, what he's gone through. He says, I think he got treated poorly. I think he had makes some good points, but he says, Who knows? You know, I I just know that he's writing because he's angry, and I'm writing out of a duty. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to go back to a couple more questions here before we move along. And here's an interesting comment, I think, um, to ponder. So Douglas Stringer says, perhaps excommunication was less of a stigma in those days. So Sister Wheeler did not see his status as a problem. That's, a, you know, that's a that's a very real possibility. Especially, you know, how it was in those days, somebody be excommunicated and the next week, 
they'd come back and say, Hey, I'm sorry. And say, all right, come back in you knucklehead, you know, and, and you're not only back in the church, you're back in the quorum of the 12, you know, it was, yeah. it, it seemed easy out, easy in kind of not, not so much today. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, Cheryl Bruno referring to the list of, uh, of women that, uh, that he wrote down, uh, says, could this be his idea of the law of adoption? Never thought about that. I, I suppose it could be. I don't know. He doesn't indicate as such. So he, he doesn't. He yeah. doesn't make. That's why I was so I was so stymied by the lists and and who was on it and why, and and the maneuvering the list. He would change and you know would it, they were numbered and sometimes he'd move them up in numbers and things. I I don't know. I just, interesting. I, you know, it's a good. It's an interesting concept. Uh, the the adoption thing. I never thought about. It. Thanks. Yeah. And then Corey Bell uh, asks, do you have a sense of what about Mormonism that he still believed in? Uh, what was the core of his Mormon faith once he no longer had confidence in Joseph Smith? You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, he doesn't say much about, um, well, I, be, he believed in the restoration. He believed in the restoration. He believed that when it originated, it was absolutely good and right, and 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 God gave them power. And he'll he'll say this: they had power given to them from God. The restoration was valid, and and the power was from God, and God was with them. They just kind of lost their way, and he he was hoping to kind of help them find their way back. You know, he he wasn't interested in, in initially, especially in starting his own church. He wanted to help them get back on track. And he would even say things like, if they would ask me, he says, I think I could help. I think I could help them find their way back on track. I don't know if he ever lost total. I mean, he, he came to believe that Joseph had lost his way, but he doesn't really uh, blast Joseph like he does some others. He, he cannot stand John Taylor and he does not like Brigham Young. But when he is, when he gets to the point where he thinks they're beyond saving as far as the church goes, and he's thinking maybe we need a kind of a, a, a new a reformation, a new restoration, and he starts to consider who he would have in leadership position, he considers some of the same people like Wilfred Woodruff mm. and and others. He still he has them on his list uh, of, of people to you know that might be uh, good for his for this new organization. Interesting. So I'm trying to think about again what. What he still believes in. He doesn't say much about the Book of Mormon. He's mainly bothered, you know, he says missionaries go out and they teach all these great principles that come from scripture, specifically the Bible. And then when they get to, when the people, converts get to Nauvoo, they find it's not so much Bible anymore, but it's just church leaders saying, you know, follow us, follow us. The Bible doesn't count anymore. That's, that's kind of his irritation. Gotcha. Now, does does he ever specifically mention Joseph Smith in connection with the practice of plural marriage? He does not. He does not mention that Joseph ever has any other wives. He, the only time he mentions Joseph in different things, but he always talks about Emma. He talks about the elite lady. He talks about her in charge of the relief study. He talks about he sees them riding their horses down the street and and this this the pomp that kind of he sees about them the the elect lady and, and, and again, Joseph, the prophet writing in their grandeur down the street, you know, the elitism again, but he never mentions anything about Joseph having any other wives. Not, okay. not, not specifically. No. Douglas Stringer asks, uh, section 125 of the DNC refers to naming a new stake across the Mississippi river in the town of Montrose, Iowa. The name of the stake was Zarahemla does only ever mention the Zarahemla stake. Uh, I don't, I don't remember him ever mentioning that. And, and, you know, he's, you know, he'd say, well, gee, Rich, you, you, you know, you put the book together, but, uh, it's been a few years. I mean, and there's, and there's I a lot in there. Yeah. I don't, I'm trying to even remember when I did the index, was there a Zarahemla in there? There may have been once, but I don't, I don't remember him talking about that. I do remember him talking about going up the Mississippi to a place that had been established by the Jaredites initially and then rebuilt by the Nephites called Colion, where he would find a whole bunch of Nephite gold. Tell us that more about that. that. This is part of his revelations. Um, 
he felt when he got to the point where he felt the church could not be salvaged and it needed to be jump started again or restarted again. He said it would cost, it would take money to do that. But he said, God has provided. And he said up the river, not that far is, is an old city that was from book of Mormon times, you know, initially a Jaredite city and then later rebuilt by the Nephites called Coleon. And he said, it's there uh, near the banks of the Mississippi where, uh, God has uh, has for me a whole bunch of gold and other treasures, buried treasures that will help fund this uh, new restoration. And so you have, that's one of his uh, revelations. Another one, when I first started reading it, and he said he was meeting with the Ancient of Days, I thought he was talking about Adam, because that's kind of my perception is the Ancient of Days is Adam. But he was actually talking about a dozen men from Old Testament times, Adam being one of them. But it was a council, the Ancient of Days. And they met with him regularly, he said, and would give him instruction of things he needed to do and, and missions he had to accomplish. And so he uh, he met with them uh, in Newell Nurse's home uh, in the attic there a, a number of days. There are three specific days where three days in a row they had big time meetings. And he said this would go down in history as the, as the important dates in history because of these meetings. He also visited with uh, um, Elijah and Elijah's wife, uh, I thought was interesting. Uh, David W. Patton, the uh, deceased uh, apostle, came to him a few times. Uh, he said that the Ancient of Days lived on the uh, on the, the uh, North Star. Uh, and uh, he talked about the second coming a lot and preparing for that and getting the world ready for that. Uh, um, and then he talked about meeting the Savior, uh, at least on, on one occasion. So those are some of his revelations. That's fascinating. Um, Reed Russell asks if we can get the spelling for Coleon. I, I, if I remember right, it's C-O-L-E-O-N. Was that an actual location or did he? No, no. Reed, the, the treasure's not there anymore, man. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Reed's heading up the river. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and there's no, by the way, uh, I, I, he never mentioned going to look for it. He also never mentions ever, never finding it. But he also talks about other, even when he's, he's not talking about Coleone, he's talking about that God has treasure set aside in the earth for him to find, to fund everything but he never mentions about finding anything. It, it makes me wonder, because we only have his writings from 1842 uh, and 1843, but it makes me wonder if he was like this back in Missouri or back in the, the Kirtland period, if he was claiming these kinds of visitations and revelations, or if he if this was something that that started in Nauvoo. Yeah, and I don't know. I, I, yeah. I have a personal theory about his writings, though. Uh, he said that he started his writings long before this, and that's why they they demanded his writings. I I, I think he had personal revelation writings down. I, I do believe he was doing some of that, but his writings for you know for uh, for uh, writing the uh, absurdities of Mormonism and spiritual wifery, I I don't think those started until after he was excommunicated. He he says they did. But the, we don't ever see them, or and, and you know they don't they don't show up. I I tend to believe, even though he said he had them, I think that's an after the, I think that's after the fact. He's saying, oh, I've had these writings for some time. I, I may be wrong on that. I may be wrong, mm -hmm. but I kind of don't think so. I think he started after his excommunication, and they when they demanded his writings, they weren't demanding any writings uh, of a negative nature. They were demanding, or th they wanted to see his writings that were uh, revelatory. That's what they wanted to see, to have them interesting against the scripture. Interesting. Yeah. Um, indicating that they may not, might not have been aware of negative writings. Yeah. I, I, and I, I tend to believe there weren't any at the time, but again, like I say, yeah. that's just my take on it. So now that you've brought them up, let's talk about these, these booklets, Absurdities of Mormonism. And uh, what was the one on spiritual wifery? It was Absurdities of Mormonism Portrayed, which was published in 1843. And Spiritual Wifery of Nauvoo Exposed 
which was published in 1845. These were booklets. And like I say, a lot of his writings that are found in the book are his preparatory, his, his initial writings, trying to, to, to get together the things he's going to publish. And he talks about, he talks about, I'm going to publish these. If they don't, you know, if they don't back off on some things, I'm going to publish them. I've given them warning. I'm going to publish them. And then eventually he does. They're booklets. They're, they're not big. Uh, in fact, both uh, Absurdities of Mormonism Portrayed and Spiritual Wifery of Nauvoo Exposed are uh, in the uh, appendix of the book in their entirety. Uh, so you can read the whole thing, uh, what he wrote. Um, and some very similar things to his, his writings in the, in the journals and things, and then some, some kind of different ones too. Well, give us, give us a little bit of, so, um, I know that in his personal writing, sometimes he could seem very incoherent in his, in his writing style. Uh, but in the booklets, I'm assuming he probably had a little more coherency. Absurdities right? of Mormonism is not much better. Uh, it, it is better. It is better, but I still think he, he probably needed an editor, Brian, you know, you know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> Spiritual Wifery of Nauvoo Exposed, it, it appears that maybe he had some help on that one. That that makes more sense, and it's it's not all over the place. It's it's uh, it's laid out a lot better, and, and uh, it's better writing, I think. He's not the best writer in the world. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, yeah, uh, no, I see that, and I, I don't know what his education level was. Um, but I, so if we look at the absurdities of Mormonism, are you saying that a lot of it contains similar complaints about uh, things like elitism and sort of that it, things were better back in the Kirtland days and, and that it was, that it seems to have kind of fallen apart now and needs to be reformed? Yeah. And, and in fact, I think you hit on something big here and that is this only wants the Kirtland church. That, that's what he wants. He wants it to be the way it was in Kirtland. And this is pretty common belief, not just with only. This is this is a lot of people uh, through throughout church history. They're, they're the people who like the Kirtland church, and there are people who, 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 when, who love the Kirtland church, did not like the Nauvoo church. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard people uh, of our, you know, of other faiths, uh, you know, of other uh, expressions of the restoration, as Steve Shields would say, uh, say the dark days of Nauvoo, uh, because that's when that's when the train came off the tracks. Is they feel like Nauvoo was a, a, a bad thing. Yeah, and I think that's what only thought. Yeah, and I mean you do see this uh, particularly from those who had exposure to what the church was like back in the Ohio period, back before the Missouri conflict, um, and then when things started changing and becoming. Um, well, I mean, I think a lot of it started with militancy, right, and sort of arming up and then creating this this society in Nauvoo that was significantly different uh, in their view from from what they had seen in Ohio when it was definitely more of kind of a Christian primitivist movement, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can I can see that, uh, and, and, but you also see that that same line of thought among even those who might not have been in the Ohio period. I think, I don't know that William Law was in the Ohio period, but yeah. he still has this idea that things were better at the earlier days. Yeah, I think they, I mean, certainly the, the ones who were there, like you say, in Ohio, whether it be uh, the Whitmers uh, or, or Oliver Cowdery, just kind of longed mm -hmm. for those earlier days. Uh, um, I, I, and I think all these writings make it clear to me that uh, the novel was a was a it was a hard time for a lot of people that that a lot of the saints were thrilled to be there were thrilled to be with the, the prophet joseph after they came from you know from uh from england and other places they from wales and and they got there and there's joseph but there are some who got there who said you know this is not this is yeah. not what we expected this is not what i thought it would be like and uh and so, and some like only stayed and some left just uh, left mm -hmm. the area and, mm -hmm. and moved uh, uh, to a different part of the state or moved out of the state entirely to, to kind of make their way and, you know, and, and try to, you know, kind of become Americans in, in, a, in a different setting, but not in that kind of religious setting. I'm going to, I'm going to propose a, a, a thought experiment here real quick um, to the people who are with us tonight. Um, if anybody has visited Nauvoo uh, now, you know, what you see is this very sort of pastoral 
uh, calm, uh, you know, lovely to walk through kind of kind of town with these big green fields and some uh, historically preserved um, homes or rebuilt, uh, you know, homes. Uh, and, and it just seems like this lovely, peaceful environment. And I would suggest that, uh, that that's not at all what Nauvoo would have been like in the experience of, of Oliver only in the experience of the, of those who came from England and from the, uh, you know, across the, the seas, um, Nauvoo would have been an extremely crowded, uh, city. Um, there were at, at its peak, I think there may have been between 10 to 13,000 people, um, just crammed into Nauvoo itself, which is not that large of a place. And so there, you know, this promise that people had that they were all going to get a square acre mm -hmm. and be able to have a little, uh, garden of their own and have some, some, uh, some pasture, have some animals on their, their acre, and then, you know, have some farmland out, uh, in the bluffs. Um, that didn't come to fruition. Instead, land was chopped down and then chopped in half and then chopped in half again. And sometimes there were up to seven families on a quarter acre. Uh, and all of this land down on the, on the flats anyway, was, con was owned by Joseph Smith. And so they were purchasing their small little lots from Joseph Smith. So if you consider what Oliver only would have witnessed of this overly crowded environment in this swamp infested uh, location, uh, I mean, they had just gone through the, the horrendous malaria infections, not too long before this. And, and you've got just ships after uh, steamships arriving with, with people from across the ocean who were converts uh, to this, to this church. And they are setting up lean tos and shacks out in these small parcels of land. Also keep in mind that Nauvoo is a very hot and humid place during the summertime. Uh, you know, just to make this more graphic, uh, people are, usually dressed in full wool attire at this time. Uh, they had animals wandering around out in the open. You would have had muddy streets. You would have had the smell of animals and humans. You would have had insects flying around you. Nauvoo was not this peaceful, pastoral, beautiful place that we tend to think of. And I have to think that there must have been, for a lot of those people, this sort of sense of, what did I get myself into? This this is not what I was expecting when the missionaries told me of this new promised land. This is the, the these are terrible circumstances, and 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 it feels to me like Olney may have been feeling the same thing in a lot of ways. Well, I th I think he represents some of the people and and their feelings there. I, I it kind of depends. I think you you read different other jur journals of other people in Nauvoo who who were very happy and very pleased with the, the, the peaceful setting and, and the way it was. I mean, uh, I, I look at, um, I, I look at some of my ancestors and, and my, my great, great grandmother, my great, great, great grandmother were part of the first relief society and they were not elite. Trust me. <laughs> they were not elite. Uh, my family was not from the elite side, but they, but the records that they left and the records that some of the other people I've read from Nauvoo left, were real positive. So I, I think it depends on the person. Yeah. I think it depends yeah. on their situation. I think it depends on what they, maybe what they were expecting. If they were, if they were troubled by uh, their expectations were not met. But I think in some cases, you know, just, just getting there and being in Nauvoo with, with, with Joseph and, and seeing, and seeing him and hearing him speak. I, and, and, uh, and maybe coming from a place in Great Britain where things were not that great. And having some, and having some land, and having, you know, it didn't matter to them. Maybe all I'm saying to you is, I think only represents one faction, right? And I think there are others who love Nauvoo and love their homes, and and said this is, we're happy to be here. I, I just I think it yeah. depends almost on their situation, but also on the person. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree definitely. But I think it is important to recognize that there is both sides. Right. This isn't. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like everybody in Nauvoo was was yeah. uh, only makes super happy. happy.
By the way, I just want to mention this. I was doing some uh, research in my own family research some years ago, and they came across a Moor who was kind of a, I think he was a horse thief. Uh, anyway, I, I said to my grandmother at the time, I, I came across this guy. Is he ours? And she goes, we don't talk about him. So clearly he was ours. <laughs> so <he's> <laughs> <laughs> Really, That's, was, yeah, we guy. don't talk about him as always the first indication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's one of my guys. All right. So well, I'm let's say I don't I don't come from the elite. So let's finish up with a couple of questions here. We're uh we're just about out of time uh for the time that we try to allot for these. I guess there isn't really a set time, but we want to, you know, let people go back go back about their evenings. Um so Summarize what what was Oliver's overall? Did he have proposals for for what he thought should really happen? Um, let's talk about maybe uh, in light of the temple being built. Like what you know, what did he think should take place? Oh, he didn't say anything about not building a temple. He just thought it should have been done. Uh, he said they're, they're, they've, they 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 say we're we're raising money for the temple in the Nauvoo house, and yet I he says I walk over and I I stand on the. Uh, the Nauvoo house and, and say, we're only up to, you know, the foundation, the temple's not moving along. He said, if I'd been in charge, you know, if, if I'd given it to certain people, he said, it'd be done by now. He says, so where's the, so he's bothered by that. He doesn't seem to be bothered that they're building a temple. In fact, there's a, there's a strange thing that after he's excommunicated and after he's remarried, and after he moves away from Nauvoo and after the death of Joseph, he comes back to Nauvoo by the way, he still refers to himself as Elder Olney. He hmm. comes back to Nauvoo, and he comes back his, in his own writing saying, I hope to be able to receive my endowment in the temple. So, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. He, says, he says as far as fixing things, you know, uh, he, he says if we could get, this is interesting, he says if we could get good moms and dads who raise good kids, just to help the prophet see these are the standards we ought to follow, you know, good standards of honesty and, and loyalty and not, not the greed and, and not the pride and not the other things. He said things could be fixed easily. That's initially, that's how what he felt. Hmm. I'm relating this a little bit to, I think, those who feel a little disaffected today from uh, from the, the LDS church. Um, and some of them look at leadership of the church as being sort of the source of, of the issue. They see elitism, they see uh, a lot of politics and bureaucracy, um, and they wonder where's the revelation, where are the old days maybe. Um, and, and, and I think that sometimes they feel like they can change things if they uh, push hard enough um, or uh I'm relating to Olney's statement that, you know, maybe the future generations of the church uh, will change things, right? And make it, uh, uh, you know, make, make it more what they want. Um, so I think it's interesting that this is, you know, I think that there's some relatability here for, uh, for some so. people who don't feel. Yeah. And, and you know me, Brian, full disclosure, you know me, I'm not one of those people, you know, I, I'm, I'm real happy. I'm real, I'm happy in the church. I'm happy with the leadership. I'm, I'm solid in that. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer. So yeah, I, I know, I see what you're saying. I see where you're coming from. I just don't happen to share those kind of feelings. Yeah. That yeah. Only, you know. yeah. More, more just, and I wasn't necessarily referring to you uh, personally. No, I, not, I know that. I just want to yeah. make it clear. But, but it does seem like uh, that, I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's interesting to me that, you know, almost, 200 years ago that there still seems to be some of these similar lines of thoughts about how to go about making the church more what you want it to be. Right. And, and there's this idea that either you expose the corruption in the church in order to make it what you want it to be, or this idea that uh, future generations will somehow be more, I don't know, progressively minded or something. And that that will, make the church more what you want it to be. Um, it's, it's just interesting to hear some of that type of line of thought. Don't, coming don't you from think it'll always be that as long as we have, as long as the church is composed of people and people have different ideas and feelings about things, there'll always be some that are, that are satisfied with the way things are 
or 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 you know patient to look for change when it comes or not patient and wanting to reach out and change things right now. I think you'll always have mm -hmm. that. I think across the board, you'll always have that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that you see that from the very beginnings of, of yeah. the church, uh, all, you know, from, from the, from basically the first days that it was established, uh, you see those who say, no, this isn't going the direction that I was expecting and that I would like to see it going in and start, uh, either they just leave or they try to change things. Yeah. Right. Fascinating. Well, um, I think that's going to wrap us up for tonight. Um, let me, uh, again, thank Richard for joining us. Uh, you can learn more about Oliver Olney through Richard's book, The Writings of Oliver H. Olney, April 1842 to February 1843, Nauvoo, Illinois. This is available through gregcofer.com, Amazon, as well as select retailers. Uh, if you joined us late tonight, we will have this discussion posted in audio through our podcast, which is the Greg Coford Books AuthorCast, uh, or we can uh, you'll also can find the video posted on YouTube. Just search for Greg Coford Books uh, over on YouTube. You'll find our channel there. And don't forget that we are currently offering a back to church sale through our website. So be sure to check out those sales at gregcofer.com. As always, we wish you health and we wish you peace. And until next time, stay safe. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.